this party stands in the Canadian Since you recently celebrated your 27th anniversary as a national party, can yes. you tell us what, ha what happened 27 years ago? How did it come into being? Well, 27 years, you know, in the history of Canada and the world has been quite momentous years mm -hmm. when we founded the party. The aim of the party was to oppose the uh, capitalist situation which uh, various forces were organizing in Soviet Union and other places, as well as to have uh, in Canada a communist party which is a party of real social revolution. Not to come to some power in, uh, in, at a city level or provincial level or federal level, but to actually create a new Canadian society on the basis of modern constitution with the modern economy and so on, and uh, so that we enter the modern era. Mm -hmm. 27 years after, big changes have taken place, and uh, uh, one of the most important aspects in which the changes have taken place is that what we were afraid of, it has happened. And that is a capitalist restoration in uh, the Soviet Union led to its collapse has led to anarchy and chaos in the whole of Eastern Europe, as well as uh, in many countries in the world. Even though the capitalists these days sort of glibly say, oh, uh, you know, I'm all right, Jack, lion, mm -hmm. but they are responsible for these things, and the same anarchy and chaos in economy and politics is appearing in other places. Like in India, we have a government of uh, 13 different political parties. Imagine the state of the parliamentary system. Mm -hmm. And same has happened in Italy, same is the case in uh, various other places, and here in Albania. Their institutions simply do not work. They're not consistent with the aspirations of the people there. So from 27 years, mm -hmm. we have uh, learned a great deal, and we are more than convinced than ever that uh, we need social revolution. I want to, I want to get to that quickly, yes. but I just want to talk a little bit about yourself because yes. this is, is your background is microbiology. How did yes. you happen to come into your position? Well, my background is also a communist. I have been a communist for a very okay. long time. Yes. Okay. And uh, you see, I was born in a very definite period, just before the First World War. Uh -huh actually when the war began. And then you go through the Second World War, you go through 50s, 60s. So these were extremely, uh, you can say, tantalizing period in which people made their personalities, they made a statement about themselves, where did they stand? Mm -hmm. And so fascism had fallen, Nazism had fallen, everybody hated the Americans, and they were known for all their crimes they had committed. Mm -hmm. Where were we going to go? Communism. And then we found that uh, these people who called themselves communists, like Khrushchev, later on Brezhnev, they were doing the same things. Mm -hmm. So not only we had to fight the traditional, you can say, forces we thought were very uh, wrong for the world, but we also had to fight our own comrades. And, exactly. and, and it has been a long fight. So t tell me a little bit now, how does your party then differ from, because there is another Communist Party yes. of Canada. Tell yes. us what, what's the difference. Well, Communist Party of Canada was founded in 1921, mm -hmm. and in the course of its development, they sort of merged into what is generally known as Liberal Labor Alliance. So they sort of, uh, they even changed their name in the uh, 40s into Pro uh, Labour Progressive Party. And later, later on, sort of uh, re-adopted the name, afraid that some Marxist Leninists may call themselves communists and so on. Okay. And this uh, Liberal Labour Alliance, basically it's an illusion that somehow the centrist forces, like uh, uh, Trudeau liberals or before that Pearson liberals and some social democrats like the CCF before and later on NDP, somehow with some magic they will change the situation. 
far from situation being changing, even their paradise, Soviet Union, fell. So now, where are they going to get their ideology? Where are they going to get their positions? Mm -hmm. So the shocking part is that instead of analyzing and standing on their feet, they are thinking that India is going left. They applauded the United Front government in India as a left government. So as far as uh, I am concerned, for all intents and purposes, Communist Party of Canada is finished. Okay. Because it is not itself ideologically sound. Like us, we developed our own ideology from Canadian and international conditions. We were no one's agents. So when these events took place, it didn't destroy us. Now who is going to give them the ideology? But this doesn't mean that many members, especially the veterans and the young communists, that they are no good. There are quite a few very good communists. And we hope that all communists will get together and uh, create a mass communist party. But as far as this other party is concerned, I see no future for that. So tell me a little bit more, because this communism that you're talking about is, is, is the modern communism, yeah. is that right, yeah. that, that, that you've written about? Yeah. So how does this differ from, from the communism of, of, of Stalin and of, and of Brezhnev and of so on? Well, uh, one cannot link Stalin and Brezhnev. They were two different eras. Okay, sorry. Okay. Stalin's era was the era of uh, socialist revolution, socialist construction, mm -hmm. and then the defeat of Nazism, defense of uh, uh, Soviet Union, anti-fascist forces, and all. And then uh, uh, it uh, followed by uh, opposition to American expansionism, uh, its uh, organizing coup d'etats all over the world, interfering with the anti-colonial struggle, national liberation movement, and so on. Brezhnev comes at a particular time to compete with U.S as an imperialist power. So he organizes a huge in military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. He participates in arms race. And so the natural result of that arms race was that their, uh, or, uh, their economy collapsed okay. by the beginning of the 80s. So where we differ from uh, uh, Leonard Brezhnev and Gorbachev is in this, that. Uh, a communist state cannot have national ambitions. It cannot be uh, just looking for its own interests. So its ambitions has to be, you can say, quintessence of ambitions of all the peoples of the world. So when Brezhnev uh, attacked the Czechoslovakia, we denounced it mm -hmm. right in 1968. And same thing we did the, with the invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. And other interferences they had in Eastern Europe, like when Khrushchev changed, all the leaders in Eastern Europe changed. Mm -hmm. And when Gorbachev came, as you know what happened, I mean, they even assassinated Ceausescu and others. Okay. So the point is that uh, communist ambitions are ambitions for all the peoples of the world. So it's not a system of domination, but it is a system whereby all the peoples stand on their own feet, express themselves, have a peaceful coexistence, mm -hmm. have economic, cultural, social exchanges, mm -hmm. and do not have any designs of domination on one another. This is where we uh, fundamentally differed with Brezhnev. This is why all this period we fought what we call Soviet social imperialism. And what about the, the current uh, uh, communist states that we have now? Is, is there, the, are the same differences there as well? Well, there is a difference in the sense, uh, let's say if we take uh, Cuba. Yes. Cuba without the Cuban revolution will have nothing. So their independence is directly linked with the uh, Castro's uh, revolution. Right. And if anyone thinks that they can do without that, that Cuba can be independent, they are gravely mistaken. So they have to carry on on their independent path 
defend the uh, Cuban Revolution. Vietnam and China, in a way, are in the same position. For example, in uh, 1989, there was sort of... When you say, sorry, when you yeah. say they're independent, independent from what? Independent from U.S., independent from European Union, independent from all these uh, other imperialist powers. Okay. Because you know that uh, Cuba, if ever a revolution fails, it will be devoured by the Americans. Cubans will be reduced to abject slaves. And this is not the case today. In spite of all the anti-communist propaganda, Cuba is one of the few countries in the world which carries out full social welfare program in mm. spite of the economic crisis and so on. Mm. And that is the strength of the you know, Cuban revolution, yes. strength of the Cuban people's quest for independence and so on. Mm -hmm. So in China, uh, in 1989, there was speculation that uh, China will break up, that the people's army will split and so on. It didn't. And we knew it will not. Because China, if it is not united as a state, it will go back to pre-1949 situation as a pulley for Europe and North America. Chinese may differ with one another. You know, somebody may want capitalism, somebody may want socialism. But no Chinese want to go back to pre-1949 situation. So Americans are caught. So is European Union. Because capitalism will mean going back to 1949 situation. Mm -hmm. It will mean subordinate themselves. It's, it is a very complex contradiction. In your literature, when you talk about the overthrow of the capitalist class, yes. tell us who is the capitalist class? What do you mean by that? Who is that group of people? Well, in, uh, say in uh, Canada today, the capitalist class is uh, those who own the main means of production. That you have uh, major industries, uh, auto, uh, railways, uh, uh, post office, uh, uh, manufacturing, mines, and so on. Mm -hmm. And who really controls? Uh, this is financial oligarchy, the rich of this country, some directly and some through the state. And uh, so we uh, suggest overthrowing them uh, both literally as well as in terms of eliminating their social system. By literally we mean is that there are some forces, like you take five banks. Do you know they make decisions for all of us? Yes. You can go as an individual citizen mm -hmm. or as a collective fate of the country. Some manager from their system, okay, tell me about your birth. It's unbelievable that nobody uh, questions this. So uh, these people cause from time to time disasters. Like if you look in uh, uh, various parts of Canada, it's uh, pockmarked by small cities coming up, small mm -hmm. towns, mm -hmm. and then becoming ghost towns. Yeah. Causes tragedies for people. And so people one day will have to ask, that why did you do these things to your own people? And then the second issue is of the system. Today we have a system which basically makes, they openly say, do everything for us, that is the rich. And they should be paid, like Bombardier has paid $87 million, this, that, and when it comes to poor, they say, oh, we have too much deficit, cut down this program, that program, when it comes to education, when it comes to health. Uh -huh. so, Somebody has to ask the question that it does cause disaster for many Canadians. So this is what we mean by overthrowing the capitalist class. And so when you yeah. say again that the capitalist economy is destructive, especially to the individual, then what, what do you mean? Maybe? First of all, uh, capitalist economy is destructive to the collective and the general interest of the society. And then to the individual taking in a concrete term, not as a generality. Because as a generality, capitalist system is a system of individualism. Few make it, That's right. 
And then they say, look at the example. This person came as a poor immigrant. He had nothing. He had five uh, cents in his pocket. Mm -hmm. And now he has become millionaire. Or you take uh, uh, the example of people who have made uh, billions uh, through a paper uh, market. And uh, so the issue here is that uh, their attack on the collective means we as a collective cannot have a collective will, means Canadians. Mm -hmm. We cannot discuss things by saying we have the same interests, let us pursue those interests. And as a result, all kinds of problems, you know, things happen to us, and we are left here listening to the most god-awful propaganda. Like uh, these days they talk about uh, a lower the age to punish the youth. From 10, uh, 12 years to 10 years to 8 years, Maybe next time they are going to take it to the womb. Mm -hmm. How is it possible that if there was a collective will, if there was collective discussion and all this, that somebody can do these things? Then in terms of individuals, like you look at uh, young people, or like at least at our times in the 60s, if you did your Bachelor of Science or Bachelor of Arts, you literally could expect somebody sending you a ticket and give you a job. All right. Is this the case today? No. Yeah. People with PhDs have nowhere to go. And what kind of uh, future these people have? So capitalism first, first hits the collective and the general interest of the society, and then individual in concrete terms. And so this society which which speaks of uh, standing for the individual. How many individuals do you think are happy here? I don't know. Liberal government says that uh, John Cratchit has uh, repeated many times that people in the world will give their last cent to come here. Very well. But has he ever talked to any Canadian how they feel? Job security, uh, job insecurity has become an epidemic. Various other ills of the society, everybody knows. Mm -hmm. All the problems which existed in 1867, whether the question of native people, whether the question of uh, uh, Quebec, or the questions of national minorities, they have not been sorted out. So what would you do then to, 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 to for instance, you talked about uh, about about the current state of, of, of uh, insecurity with, yeah. among ourselves. People that have jobs, we're not sure we're going to have a job next week or next month. Uh, the jobless rate is is officially at ten percent, but mm -hmm. we everybody but, seems to say that it's higher than that. Yeah. So, what would you do to to correct those? Well, the starting point is uh, that uh, immediately uh, two changes has to be brought about. One is in the uh, political process. Uh -huh whereby it is not political parties which select candidates. People select candidates themselves, mm -hmm. and they elect them. And then they also have to have the right to set their agenda and so on. And do you sort of like proportional representation? Is that proportional true? representation is the same thing. It still marginalizes everybody. Still, it's the political parties which decide. For instance, uh, now there are going to be candidates. Like a, <coughs> a national leader of a party can nominate any candidate by law. Okay. Yes, we, we know that very well. Yeah. Anybody who wants to run as a Marxist Lamis, they need my signature. Okay. It doesn't matter how many uh, uh, people may be behind them who want them to be candidate. If I don't put my signature, it will not happen. Okay. So, yeah. sorry, then. You're saying that in writings and in, in, in individual writings, we wouldn't have the party system. We would just vote for the person that we wanted to represent that writing. Is that right? No, the, the issue here is that uh, voters have to involve themselves in politics. Selecting candidates, electing candidates, setting agenda, and uh, recalling people who they don't like, recalling legislation which they don't like. Like say if this system had existed in Ontario, mm -hmm. Mike Harris would have recalled many times over because this democracy, the 19th century democracy, what it has, what has happened to it is like this. On one hand, 
there is a universal franchise. But still the property owners, they control, they dominate. So the popular will comes in clash with the interests of the uh, uh, rich. And so in, the, as a, uh, in the return, like when this clash takes place, the only thing Mike Harris or anybody else can say, well, you elected me. And we can say, well, we had no choice in the sense that it's your system in which, uh, like you bring five jokers on a voting uh, a ballot, and then we have to take mark. And we don't know any one of them. Why not uh, a selection takes place in the universities, in the factories, in the uh, neighborhoods, and people select their own candidates? So this is absolutely crucial to come to the 20th century and prepare to enter 21st century. And uh, uh, John Cratian says that constitutional question we are not going to touch. It's very convenient for them that we are not going to touch because, you see, they would better like to see people cynical. They would like people to be uh, extremely upset with politics, politicians, and so on. Why? It's very convenient for them. Why? Because people, once they are not engaged, then they can have any kind of government, they can carry on whichever way. Otherwise, like, it is possible that the young Kratian type of person mm -hmm. could become Prime Minister of Canada. Yes. A man from Schwinningen. Yes. They popularize him as a simple man. Yes, that's right. 20th century requires a man with a broad vision, not a simple man. A man of sciences, a man who's a statesman, a worldly, worldly wise man, a man who can see Canada as an integral part of people's liberation on the world scale. John Cratian cannot see. He merely sees where his uh, direct interest is. Mm -hmm. Because there is something where you mentioned that you want to, you want, you want to get together with the other political parties and raise the profile of politics. Yes. yes. So explain that. Is that? Well, we want uh, various political parties like we are now in the uh, final uh, period of uh, putting final touches on our program, that we want different political parties, political personalities, journalists, others, actually to speak about what should be our agenda. Let's take that as, as an example. Okay. So that discussion should not finish. It should carry on until the time election takes place, let people decide. So nobody should say, well, this is the agenda, that this discussion is finished. So now, before even the election has begun, they have declared, well, deficit uh, is the issue, or accountability of the liberal government is the issue. Who cares about uh, liberal accountability? Who cares about this uh, deficit finances? You go across the country, People are worried about social programs. Right. They are worried about job security. Mm -hmm. They are worried about what is happening to their children, to their families. They are worried about what is happening to the environment and our relations internationally. But they have set the agenda. Uh, Sherry, as you know, he has, they have two members of parliament. And he was presented as if he was a hero as a Canadian politician with this little program of uh, decreasing the tax burden by 10 percent and all right. this, another deception, and given such a large amount of coverage. No other person was uh, interviewed. Nobody asked us. We had a meeting with the, our uh, uh, broadcast, arbit broadcast arbitrator, you know, the uh, person who decides how much time each political party oh, yes. should have. Okay. His name is Mr. Grant. Okay. For several years, we have been informing him that between political parties, there can be only equality and not equity. Explain the difference. Equity is uh, when, you know, like say, uh, you have a country where some national minority is being badly done by. 
And so you said you will have affirmative program to undo that situation. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that national minority which is in a bad position, you will take some other measure which otherwise you will not take. And you will bring the situation uh, to acceptable level, okay. to affirmative action and all that. Equality is where everybody has to have the same playing field, same resources, and so on. So how can between political parties there be equity, number okay. one? But when equity is practiced between political parties, it is not to help the small parties. It is not to say that we will have affirmative action program, that we will have this uh, Herd Al Baines more on the radio, television, to let his views be known. Mm -hmm. Then somebody else who's uh, you know, already uh, well known or whose views already get known because of being prime minister and so on. So Grant made an interesting comment last, uh, last time. He says, uh, make a proposal to us. Well, we have been making proposal every year. Okay. And he rejects it by saying, there is no consensus between parties, which is also not true. There is a consensus between all small parties. But not among the major ones. Anti-democratic parties, they cannot have that. Because they can uh, safeguard their position only through arbitrariness. When was the last time you met with Mr. Grant then? Was that this past year? Uh, just uh, three, four weeks ago. Three weeks. So? No, even less than that. Two weeks ago there was a meeting of all the parties. And again, his answer was that there wasn't consensus yes. among the... And another interesting thing took place there, that there was a CRTC person there, uh -huh. as well as uh, somebody was uh, from CVC. Okay. The issue was raised that in Canada, electors do not have informed vote. They are not informed what the issues are and so on. So they try to suggest that this is the case and so on. But anybody who watches CBC, it is a bunch of uh, fanatical, prejudicial lot who, like, many times I, I get embarrassed even looking at them because they are his master's voice. Hmm. Whatever agenda is set, they carry on. So CRTC actually had to admit that yes, there is a problem make a proposal. But CRTC is the one mm -hmm. which is to set things right. Why don't they make a proposal themselves? Okay, but they asked you to make a bit of proposal. Yes, and we will. We will very soon. Okay, well, you'll have to yes. very soon, yes. Yes, but for us, uh, you know, it will require a lot of funds and all this. They will ignore us, elections will come, go somewhere uh, uh, one year, two years, three years after. There will be small news from the CRTC accepted or rejected and so on. The point is that this is so glaring that Canadian electorate goes to vote without being informed what are the issues. They don't even know which political parties are in action. Mm -hmm. yeah, even this much is not known to them. There's something else that you say about about politics and about people and about the people that are involved. You say that in our society, this is kind of interesting, I thought, that, that we're discouraged from entering politics. Yes. Can you go on about that? And about well, uh, there is uh, this discouraging... The youth especially. You, yes. you meant you discouraging politics. takes place in various ways. Number one, politics is considered merely a mechanism to capture some positions. Like in Canadian society, very few people uh, think this way, that the elected positions are only very few. Prime Minister is not elected, Cabinet is not elected, Governor General is not elected, right. Armed Forces are not elected, Civil Service are not elected, and so on, the uh, judges, and these are the pillars of the society. Mm -hmm. Then you have a, people, a Senate is not elected, then you have election to House of Commons. And the election is merely like, like the politics is merely presented like this. You want to take a career, enter House of Commons, and will it be uh, beneficial to you? Can you make a better 
uh, uh, career there than doing something else. Then many young people, they enter politics by actually having feelings against the status quo parties. And they get persecuted. Like, you know, in a, this is called a democratic society. Mm -hmm. In a high school, you could not have your club to form, a, a, to discuss politically. No. Yes, without having a principal agreeing, without a teacher agreeing, they will not make any facilities available to you. Mm -hmm. And generally, uh, there is a lot of discouragement and then finally the issue is that uh, when a political mechanism is whereby people give this to be privileged to one another, you don't have to be political. You can join a labor union. You can be a member of Canadian Labor Congress and come to some arrangement yeah. somewhere. Mm -hmm. You can be on Business Council of National Issues. Mm -hmm. You can be you know, somewhere else. You can uh, declare your special interest group. You could be an ethnic, an immigrant, a woman, a youth. So politics, in strict sense of the word, where people participate in governing themselves, that politics doesn't exist here. Because they don't govern themselves. Representative democracy, it was all right between property classes. That all right that this, this group of property people can come to power today and then we can wait three, four years and then we will do whatever we wish. No longer when uh, you have a universal franchise, when you have a collective uh, uh, interest, when you have general interest of the society, this democracy simply doesn't work. Hmm. Um, a lot of people say that communism is godless. And yeah. I'm wondering if you'd like to explain a little bit about about the, its role or lack of role in, in, a, in a communist state? Yes. Communism is uh, godless in the same way all modern science is. Modern science has its origin in repudiation of uh, uh, creation science, all the mystical and hodgepodge theories, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole period of uh, the uh, enlightenment period of Age of Reason and other periods, they, were, they have been known in rejecting medievalism, hocus pocus, and so on. At the same time, there is the issue of uh, individual conscience. When communism comes to individual conscience, communists have no statement to make on this. Communism or communist state does not in any way tell anybody that what they should practice. Okay. At the time of Karl Marx, first, uh, once there was a very big contro controversy that somebody had written that we will ban religion and all this. Mm -hmm. And he said religion will not be banned in, the, in a socialist state. As a society develops, people may choose not to practice religion. They may choose to do that. Okay. So as a science, whether we speak about natural sciences, social sciences, God has no place there. As right to conscience, as a matter of individual conscience, communists are not against anybody practicing religion. Mm -hmm. This is what the position is. Um, I wanted to, for, to have you to, to talk a little bit about your policies, but I think that you've, you've, you've covered a lot of that. Um, yes. I just want you to talk a little bit about Quebec and, 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 and about what what do you think we should be doing with, with Quebec? Well, for, for instance, let's go back to the referendum. What was your position on that? How did you...? Well, the issue of Quebec really is a, a question whether Canadian, you know, wants to be modern or not, whether they want to enter 20th, 1st century as a equal, independent, fraternal people building their country, or they want to remain uh, in old fights emerging from 19th century. Mm -hmm. Uh, liberals have decided to keep the old fights going. So, so our stand in Quebec in the last referendum was that Quebec people are sovereign people. As a sovereign people, they have they have right to uh, remain in this confederation or not remain in the confederation. 
But we are very confident that as a sovereign people, if they decide to separate what they call, yes. they will also decide to have a modern union between Quebec, Canada, and native peoples, and so on. So there is a, a more exciting prospect whereby people build their new confederation themselves okay. as free people. So they want to keep the old confederation and carry on old mythology and lies. Mm -hmm. Like some people even say Canada has a constitution. A royal proclamation is called a constitution. That's what British North America Act was. And to suggest that Canadian people actually voted for confederation mm -hmm. is another mythology. Mm -hmm. Canadians didn't vote for a, a constitution in 1982 either. So the point is that we should, Canadian people will, as they did, like say, in the period of uh, Spicer Commission, yeah. do you know how many people talked about constitution? Quite a few. Yeah, how many proposals and so on. Mm -hmm. And we should have that. We should have a modern constitution. And everybody should give their views. Freddie, when you, when you go campaigning door to door, yes. what, what, what kind of reaction do you get? Do you have conversations like we're having now? I mean, obviously, yes, some people yes. you must. We have, a, we have very activist people. They have conversations all across the country. And uh -huh. that, uh, in amongst these things, there are lot, uh, generally a lot of agreement. But you see, Canada has ruled by creating an atmosphere of anxiety, fear. Like after, say, somebody listens to you and agree with you and so on, or say, say, well, you may not get elected. Then what? Of course, they are not going to let a Marxist Leninist get elected. They will do everything possible. Like Marxism Leninism in this country, it is slandered through the universities, through the high schools, mm -hmm. It is slandered through the official representatives of Canadian government, provincial governments, and so on. And still we are supposed to face this. Uh, we, I mean, we did elect a communist member back in, I think, was yeah. that right, with Fred Rose? <laughs> in, I mean, it, it could still happen. <laughs> yes. No, no, but that election didn't mean anything. It only meant that uh, uh, the people in Montreal, they were awakening, slowly and slowly opening their eyes. And they knew these capitalist politicians are not going to do anything for them. And, uh, but the issue here is that uh, what we are saying is very exciting and people accept that, but the political mechanism is used hmm. to divert people into some, something else. Like the person who got elected from uh, Ottawa Centre, where I'm going to most probably run again. Yes. You ask him, what vision you have for Canada? Or you ask any a conservative the reform party, if he has no vision for Canada, what Canada will look like in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. If your creator doesn't have a big vision, why are they in politics? So t well, well, tell me, what's your vision for Canada in the 21st century then? Well, I mean, I already... Uh, I know you talked uh, no, about that. Talked about various ways. I like uh, Canada to change its direction in the economy, stop paying the rich, moratorium on debt, mm -hmm. increase investment in social programs, a modern constitution, no election without selection and so on. And uh, all you know, people should be accepted as sovereign, Quebec people, native people, their hereditary rights should be recognized. Uh, there should be a modern citizenship law whereby all of us are equal instead of having what they call their bilingualism, biculturalism, under which only uh, uh, two languages and two peoples are recognized. And uh, in international affairs, we need uh, uh, all countries should be equal. All the uh, military and uh, economic blocks should be ended. They should be just United Nations that should be modernized. But people should do that. It's very exciting. You don't have a provincial wing, do you, for the Marcus Linus? You only run federally, is that correct? We also run provincially from time to time. Yes. Oh, you do? Yes. In, in, in Ontario? But we Quebec? don't organize in that way as a provincial wing. Yeah, so how do you organize then? 
We have just as uh, our regional committees or provincial committees in various areas, okay. and which will uh, run for both, if, yeah. if necessary. And, you ha and you're planning on running how many candidates in, in how many ridings this year? Well, we have to run a minimum 50 candidates just to be recognized as a, uh, okay. a political party. And uh, at one time, when we, were, we had quite a large momentum, we ran 176 candidates. When was this? This was in the 1980 election. Is that so? Yes. And uh, this time it could be anywhere between 50 and 100. And you've but got, a, and sorry, there's a, you've got a new policy this this year. You're trying to run 50% women candidates, 50% youth candidates. Yeah, we always had a lot of women. Okay. Yeah. But how are how are you going to ensure that you have 50% women and 50%? Well, it depends on uh, the members themselves. We don't interfere. Like I don't. You're not going to uh, impose like. No, I don't go to uh, <laughs> tell anybody. If women are not very active uh -huh. and youth are not very active, how do you nominate a woman and a youth? Uh -huh. So it presupposes that we have very active women and very active youth. This is in this area. I'm quite sure there will be 50% youth and 50% women because that's the case. That's the composition of the party in Ottawa Hall area. Uh -huh. In some uh, city, this may not be the case. You, you're quite. Um you have a website, you have uh, uh, the, uh, the Marxist Lemnus Daily, which yeah. is published every week. Yeah. It costs money. Where do you, where do you Marxist get your funding Marxist Daily is uh, every day. Okay, sorry, every day then. <laughs> and then we also have weekly. Okay, and, but the funding for that, that comes from? The funding for that, it comes uh, from the members, the sympathizers, and so on. Uh -huh. And uh, our party, right from 1970, has never accepted uh, money from anyone else. Okay. Yeah. And 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 to, to, how much does it cost on the your party per year? Can I ask you that? Oh, it's very expensive affair, you know, considering the uh, readership. But uh, in the la during the last, uh, I will say, two years, especially one year, the interest in the party is growing, mm -hmm. and it's very surprising. And we, anyway, we are very happy about it. That uh, people write uh, literally every day. That they're inquiring about the party, want to join the party, and mm -hmm. so on. So once the readership, say, goes uh, over 2,000 a day, yes. then it will not be a burden. Then okay. it will cover its own costs. It won't pay the volunteers, but it will cover the printing and other costs. And uh, we have a plan to transform our party into a mass party as we go on. You've been leader for 27 years for this. Yes. How have you managed to hold on to the leadership for so long? <laughs> leadership in the Communist Party is uh, actually the center committee plus the leader. Okay. It's not leader doesn't have any power actually in a center in a Communist Party. A leader cannot set any policies. A leader cannot uh, uh, in any way uh, override uh, anything. So, and the leader cannot be elected directly by the membership. The leader is elected only by the center committee. Okay. And so center committee, you can say, is the powerful body. And, uh, and so the way the leaders are chosen, that is the way the center committee, its composition is chosen, is the question of line during the period that uh, uh, how will you sort out various problems facing you? Like the, the problem we are posing for ourselves at this time is how to transform ourselves into a mass communist party. So for this reason, you need to have a coherence, ideological, political, economic, which then uh, you know, goes from your party to the masses of the people. Societies cannot be changed without having that coherence. So this center committee in uh, from sixth uh, Congress has been tackling with this problem, and uh, so that's why it is leader. If it stops, uh -huh. it will be replaced. So how many people are on this committee then? It uh, had 23 alternate uh, full members and alternate members. Okay, and you meet and it. And by the way, and by the way, majority of them are women. Oh, is that so? Okay. It's, and, and, and you meet how often? Usually once in uh, three months at least, because it, it's a policy setting body. 
Okay. But uh, these days, uh, since for last year, we actually have a large meeting where we invite about 40 to 50 people to come. And we have uh, these uh, national or uh, central forums okay. in which that whole policy is presented and so that other people can also give their opinions. We just held one very recently on the occasion of our 27th seventh, uh, anniversary of founding of the party. And, and this is, of course, on top of, because you have congresses every, what, four yes. years or every five years? Uh, generally every five years. Okay. And, and this, you have one scheduled for 97, do you? Yes. Know? This congress is going to be held uh, in Ottawa from uh, September 25th to October 4th this year. What, what are you expecting for this in this next election? What are, you, what are your goals? What are you hoping for? Well, we... Uh, are very well organized to raise the issue with the people about the uh, need to prepare the country for the 21st century. So for us, uh, participating in the election is uh, another forum for struggle. So last time they were trying to suggest that uh, communists may be wiped out because they won't have 50 candidates. We will have 50 candidates and prove them they are not wiped out. Mm. Then. Uh, we will take the issue to the electorate in various ways that uh, the issue is not who comes to power. The issue is a uh, year, two years down the road, what is going to happen to us? 21st century is around the corner. What will be known? Uh, we will be known as people. And lastly, which is very important, we hope to uh, forge a certain level of uh, understanding with other small parties. In Quebec, we have been very successful. There is a, uh, a already a alliance of small parties there, and it has existed for one year, and uh, slowly they are trying to take some actions. Literally all the small parties have joined. And uh, in Canada, federally, we have uh, very, uh, nine parties which agreed on the uh, broadcast time and so on. Okay. But there will be other areas, there will be space to get together. For example, in Canada, even within the present system, it will be good if these, like say, if uh, liberals and uh, others were democratic, they should say that any serious party should have their leader and chief, uh, 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 somebody else in the House of Commons. It will only enrich the House of Commons. But they know, then they cannot convert House of Commons into a circus. So somebody is going to come there and say that, well, I am not a rustic man, I am a man of science, both natural and social science, and according to this, this is the way the society should be run. Mm. So we hope to go with various political parties and say, hey, if you are serious, your views may not be acceptable to us, but these are serious views, like Christian Heritage Party or a Natural Law Party or a Libertarians, which generally will be known as right-wingers or Green Party, and uh, we had previously National uh, Party and so on. But we say you have serious opinions. Let us debate them. Let's discuss. Discussion is good for everybody here. So we hope to come to some arrangement uh, with these uh, political parties. We, we think that they are very serious political parties. The other thing I want to uh, talk to you about as well, uh, again, speaking about um, about um, about your ambitions and, and, and so on and, and, and um, tell me well, who votes for who votes for the CPCML who votes for the Communist Party Marxist Leninist who describe for me the voter the typical voter that you have well, like say in Montreal if you want real vote okay one time there was a judicial recount in one of the writings there. When the, election, when the counting was done before, the first, uh, the, our candidate was shown to have 100 votes. Okay. When the judicial recount was, it was over 500 votes. So who are these people? They are known in the sense you can, you can see with the neighborhood and others. First of all, we have uh, advanced workers vote for us. Okay. And then we have uh, many women who vote for us. And then we have young people who vote for us. 
And basically, like the vote comes from, which is the most exciting and positive thing is, are the people who are the uh, generations coming out of the settlers, in the sense people who have stake in the Canadian society. They are not just, uh, you know, transient coming and going. You know, and in this, uh, there are many, many immigrants, of course, who uh, have a lot of stake in Canada. But uh, uh, communism uh, more and more is uh, being accepted by these permanent settled populations across mm -hmm. the country. But mostly, but mostly urban? Mostly urban. Mostly urban. And, and, and working class, as you said? Yeah. yeah. Advanced workers, yeah. You know, people who... Something, you, you've been talking a little bit about, about the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and that hasn't harmed your cause at all. You've said it's, it's, it's actually, it's a, you've, you've had an increase in, in... No, but if we were their agencies, their gramophone... Then it would. Then right? Sure, that, uh, that we have nothing not. to say. Uh -huh. We had our, our own heads. Uh -huh. Even when I was this, uh, you know, small and was a communist, I said, the only thing one has is one's head. If you lose your head or hand over to somebody else, then you have nothing. So even though we were communists, you know, we were flag and all this, but we never stop doing our independent thing. And this is what characterizes Communist Party of Canada, Marxist Leninist, Marxist Leninist Party of Canada. Mm -hmm. And that's why they hated us. Because we could say to Brezhnev that you're social imperialist. That if you follow this uh, you know, arms race, it will cause disaster to their economy and so on. And uh, so. Uh, because we were thinking, we went through this period fighting. Generally speaking, 89 uh, up to present. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far from anything damaging happening, of course, there are all kinds of people, you know, they come and go. And when they see difficulties, uh, they... Let me give you one very interesting instance. Okay. In 89, mm -hmm. we were in an excellent position in Montreal. We had recruited... Which riding? Do you know? At, in Montreal okay. altogether, okay. in Quebec. Okay. So we had recruited more than 5,000 members there. Mm -hmm. 1,500 of them signed to form the party in Quebec to register Marxist Leninist Party of Quebec okay. and so on. And uh, we were going great guns in the Tiananmen Square took place. The whole thing collapsed. Hmm. Not us. But that mass school because people were thoroughly confused. And so we get affected generally by international events. And so people, uh, rightly or wrongly, they start connecting us. Like ma still many people, uh, when they look at us, they say, oh, what was Soviet Union? Mm -hmm. Well, we have been opposing Soviet Union since 1958-59. And so they don't listen that what was our position, why did we oppose the Soviet Union? So international, that kind of impact, it has a, uh, one time there was a, a Chinese uh, contradiction with Vietnam in 79. We had the same uh, disaster. And, uh, but otherwise, as far as the party is concerned, it doesn't have that impact because we do our own thing and we stand on our own feet. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Baines, it's been very uh, interesting talking to you. Thank you very much for. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Very and good luck in the next in the, in the election. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. For more information, contact the Communist Party of Canada Marxist Leninist at 613 241 7052.